December 8, 1987. Presidents Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev convene at the White House to sign the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. It's hard to overstate the importance of this day. You know, years of tension, animosity, hostility, nu potential nuclear war culminated in this agreement, which most experts will point to as the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Now, before President Reagan sits down to sign the agreement, he utters three famous words. Those words, of course, are trust but verify. I don't think he could have ever imagined how far these three words would carry. Trust but verify became a phenomenon. It was everywhere, everywhere you could look. It was on military platoons. It was in high school classrooms. It was in corporate boardrooms. You, hell, you could even find it on t-shirts and mugs. But here's the thing, Trust But Verify wasn't just this passing meme. No, what it was, was a worldview. It was a worldview that became embedded in our American culture. Now, I like to ask the question, why? Why is it that these three simple, innocuous words seem to just pervade everywhere we look? Well, I think the answer is because it sounds like a great deal. And if there's one thing Americans love, it's a great deal. It's like the all-you-can-eat buffet. If for a one low price you can give me hamburgers and sushi, sign me up. <laughs> and trust but verify sounds like the ultimate deal, doesn't it? Because what it sounds like is you can get all the benefits associated with trust, but at the same time, you get none of the downside. If you can just verify a little bit. If you can look over the fence, just a tiny bit, just a little bit of a peek, you can limit all the rest. Well, as Milton Friedman once told us, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And what I will tell you today is there's no such thing as trust but verify. It's a ridiculous concept. You have trust and you have verify, two completely opposing strategies, and one actually precludes the other. Now, it's important to, to talk about which trust I'm referring to here, because I'm not talking about the touchy-feely trust that we accumulate with people over time. That type of trust is a little more complex and there's some morality associated with that, right? We feel like we should trust other people, just for humanity's sake. I'm not talking about that at all, folks. What I'm talking about is trust is a cold, hard strategy. It's something that's off or on, we execute it or not. There's no right or wrong here, there are just costs and benefits. So what I want to talk to you about today are those costs and benefits. I think in any given moment, in any given situation, particularly in organizations, we're faced with this choice. Do we trust or do we verify? And I'd like to talk a little bit about that choice today, particularly through the lens of speed and innovation. In a world that's being dominated by speed and innovation, what's the choice that we should be making more often than not? So let me start with trust. Trust is what we call a high variance strategy. It's high risk. Sometimes you get amazing results. Sometimes you get abysmal results. It's kind of the game you play when you deal with trust. So the best example is a committed relationship. So with the relationship with two loving partners, that execute trust often and fully, you get the potential for amazing results, the type of intimacy and fulfillment that people only dream about. But you also get the potential for very bad results. You get the potential, <laughs> you get the potential for pain, the potential for heartbreak, the potential for getting chased around the room with a shotgun. This is all potential consequences of trust, and we need to know that going in. Then you have this other thing, which is called verify. Verify is what we call a low variance strategy. So what it does is it normalizes results. You're probably not going to end up with amazing results, but you probably will avoid the cataclysmic results as well. So this is trackapartner.com. For $40 a month, you and your significant other can exchange GPS devices and know exactly what they're doing and what, when they, where they are any given moment and of any given day. Now this is a great strategy if you want to prevent lying, cheating, adultery. Horrible strategy if you want a relationship that actually leads to fulfillment. But that's a trade-off that we make, right? It probably won't be that good, but it might not be that bad either. Now, I make fun, but I'm not trying to knock Verify, because Verify can be an extremely useful strategy, particularly when the cost of failure is high. Because when the cost of failure is high, and a potential error or a mistake can lead to catastrophe, well, the payoff for Verify is incredibly good. We just have to realize that we're making a sacrifice. What we're sacrificing, more often than not, are both speed and innovation. So as a part of the INF Treaty, both the Americans and the Soviets had teams installed in each other's countries to inspect, to make sure we were both following through on our agreements. Now, 
Here's the thing. It turns out we weren't particularly concerned at how innovative the Soviets were at dismantling their nuclear weapons. We just wanted to make sure that they did it. And we also didn't care how fast they were either, because speed wasn't the primary objective here. Safety was. And so verify was a really smart thing to do. It's the same reason why Bank of America's website will log you off every 15 seconds. You can't even go to the bathroom and come back without having to re-enter your password. But this is incredibly useful, right? Because they're not concerned with speed. What they're concerned with is your safety. They're concerned with preventing a security breach. And that's why Verify is a really useful strategy. And it's the same reason why we have co-pilots in the cockpit. Because we don't care how innovative or fancy maneuvering the pilot is. We just want him to take us safely to our destination. And every now and then, maybe once in a while, do it on time. And so these are all examples of where Verify are, is an incredibly good strategy. But that's because speed and innovation don't matter so much. But what happens when they do? What happens when speed and innovation matter a great deal? Well, then we have a problem. Because Verify can kill speed. In fact, even a little Verify can kill speed. So in track and field, they have this expression. It's called no looking. So if you're on a relay team, the way they train you to catch the baton, or receive the baton from someone else, is without looking at the person behind you. You want to look. You want to verify to check that it enters your hands correctly, but you can't because the name of the game in a race is speed. And if you verify for just one second, you lose precious time and you lose the race. This is similar to the military. There's a 26-year-old army captain right now who's stationed on a small field base on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's got full authority to order joint fire, both artillery and air. Now, this is crazy because 30 years ago, if this young man tried to order fire, without permission from his boss, he'd be court-martialed. So what's changed? Everything has changed. His enemies decentralized. The Taliban could come at him from any moment, in any direction. He doesn't have time to wait for his commanders to verify every one of his decisions, to have a meeting to tell him what to do. It slows him down. And if they're forced to verify, people lose their lives. It's that simple. And so verify can kill speed. The other thing verify does is it kills creativity. It can kill creativity. And we have to be really careful, because even a little verify can kill creativity. So I, I, lately, I've been watching a lot of HGTV. Um, yeah, I, I know. I, I think I'm depressed or something. Uh, <laughs> and my favorite show is a show called Color Splash with David Romstad. And if you ever watch the show, it's fantastic. I mean, simple premise. They take a house that looks boring, and they turn it into a house that looks fabulous. Some of the guys, I can see nodding their head <laughs> silent, very conspicuously. Um, and what happens is, it, by the way, David Romsett is a full-on artist. Anybody who's ever seen this work, this guy works miracles. He really does. He'll take a room that looks like this, and he'll turn it into a room that looks like this. Now, he makes this look really easy. Through the magic of television, it only takes him 22 minutes. <laughs> but don't be fooled. This is not easy. This is not simple. Right? It takes him and his entire team to engage in the entire creative process in order to make this work of art happen. Right? And what that means is he has to produce an environment and conditions for himself that lend themselves to this type of creativity. So he's got a rule. No looking. On day one, if you're the homeowner, you pack your bags and you leave. And you're not allowed to come back until the job is done. Now, if you're the homeowner, this can be a little stressful. Because even though you have David Bromstad in your corner, you still want to check. You still want to peek, just verify a little bit. But there's a problem. Because before the room looks like this, at one point, it looks like this. And David knows if the client sees this, he's got two potential problems on his hand. The first problem is obvious. If the client sees this, they might freak out and fire David. The second problem, though, is not so obvious. It's a little more subtle, but I think it's even more important. And here's what it is. If the artist knows that this is going to be observed, they're compelled to change it. They're tempted to make this look better than it actually is, to take something that's not display ready and turn it into something that's display ready. And this, my friends, is a tragedy. Because as we all know, creativity is fundamentally a destructive process. Creativity never looks like this. Veronica's coats didn't follow this path. Neither did Rashid's documentary. It never looks like this. Creativity looks just like this more so. It's messy. 
no matter what innovation, product, work of art, that looks magnificent now, at what point it looked like hell? Because there are ups and there are downs, there are highs and there are lows. And the problem is, if there's an observer there to verify, what we're tempted to do as people, as human beings who care what other people think, is to make the low not as low. And here's the problem. Without the absolute lows, it's impossible to have the absolute highs. So David, uh, Dave Matthews has this great quote. He says, once you stop the painting and show it to somebody else, it no longer belongs to you. And I think this is profound. I think this is one of the reasons why some of the great artists of our time have gone deep into isolation to do their work. They've gone to deep into the woods or in the mountains to free themselves from, the op from observation because they knew if they could just own a tiny piece of their process, the work would be uncompromised. It would be magnificent. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if Leonardo da Vinci was forced to show up to daily status meetings. <laughs> to check in every day, to report his progress, to defend his decisions. Would we have ended up with a miracle? Would we have ended up with something so magnificent, something so uncompromised as the Last Supper? I don't think we would have. But why is it that we only extend this type of autonomy of art to dead prima donna painters? Why don't we ever think about this when we talk about our computer programmers, when we talk about our call center technicians, or even our lawyers? Why is it that their work is any less creative, any less innovative? Why is it that they deserve any less ability to engage in the entire creative process unhindered by constant fear or threat of observation? Well, here's the good news. I think this is changing. And I think this is changing because the world is changing. We all know that everywhere we look, the cost of failure is going down dramatically. In a digital world, the cost of bits and atoms pales in comparison to the cost of bricks and steel. A lot of you spend your time on computers doing some type of knowledge work. If you make a mistake, compare that to the type of mistake you would have made in the 1930s factory. There is no comparison. It's not nearly as catastrophic, not nearly as expensive. And Verify, which was so good at preventing the catastrophic error, its payoff isn't as high when the error isn't as catastrophic. And the premium for speed and innovation have gone through the roof. So in a world dominated by Google, there can only be 10 winners in any category, right? And I would argue five above the fold, because if I have to scroll down, or if I have to go to page two to find you, you're invisible. You don't exist. It's only the game-changing innovations that win anymore. It's only the miracles that are the ones that are seen in the marketplace anymore. But none of this matters without speed, because as Seth Godin will tell you, in revolutionary times, which we are in, the number of decisions that need to be made on a daily basis goes up geometrically. And if we can't make those decisions quickly, if we can't act with speed, we can't get the innovation to the marketplace. And if we can't get the innovation to the marketplace on time, it's not an innovation. Because like it or not, innovation is now a giant race. And we're all in it together. And in that race, trust but verify just doesn't work anymore. Not, as, not only is it a flawed model that doesn't make sense, it doesn't lend itself to the type of speed and innovation we need right now. Now, I think we need a fundamentally new paradigm. I think now more than ever, we need to trust fully without verify. Every organization, business, individual in this room who interacts with people, needs to find opportunities to push the limits of trust to find out where the edges are. I know, this is incredibly difficult. The edges are scary, they're risky, they're unpredictable, and they're almost impossible to manage. But here's the other thing about the edges. That's where all the miracles are. Thank you. <laughs>